Welcome to Trends with Benefits, an award-winning podcast by Van Eck with a forward-looking perspective. We explore new ways of thinking about the markets, work, and life. Here's your host, Ed Lopez. Ben Johnson, welcome. Thanks, Ed. Great to be here. I'm really happy to, to talk to you and, and kick off the year and talk about what's to come in the asset management space first off. And I asked you to to be in a spot where I could see them, all the guitars, I wanted to talk a little bit about the guitars and understand how often you get to play. Right. Not not nearly as often as as I'd like to add in in you know, my my rock career has been a story of steady decline ever since uh I, I think it was maybe the year nineteen ninety nine when my band uh named the Hopeless Dreamers, which was actually a lyric we stole from a, a fellow local band named Lucky Boys Confusion, uh, that went on to, you know, like semi big success. Uh, we headlined a show in uh, Aurora, Illinois, at a, a venue called Riley's Rock House, which I think now is an enterprise rent a car uh, outlet, if if I'm not mistaken. So it's it's been a story of steady decline ever since then. But that's awesome. Did you have the the hair, or was this during like the grunge phase when everybody cut their hair short? Oh, I I, I had a hair phase. I had an earring phase. I, I I had one of all of those phases. There was there was a lot of teenaged angst that I channeled through, uh, you know the the whole grunge era. You had a couple small ones there. You got like uh, a little family band action going on. Yeah. So my eldest daughter uh, picked up guitar a few years ago, and actually just this summer was in a, a school of rock summer camp. So they oh cool uh, had their own performance here at a, a nearby dive bar of of all places. So uh, you know I had this sort of like you know I'm not crying, you're crying moment, and in, in the back of the the crowd there is. My oldest was rocking out to songs that, you know, I I used to rock out to when I was her age. So it was a <laughs> it was a big big moment in in the Johnson household. That's awesome. So you know, I just moved into a new house, and this is a new setting for the podcast. And I'm trying to figure out what to put on the walls. And I'd love to be able to put cool guitars and stuff like that, but that would be kind of like for me, kind of just showing off or posing because I don't feel like I'm really that good to <laughs> put guitars on the wall. I, I feel that way every time anyone remarks on the guitars. And there's, yeah. <laughs> there's more dust on on those than uh, you can probably pick up on on the camera, and, and then I care to admit. At least you were in a band. Absolutely, at least. <laughs> well, cool. Again, thanks for uh, joining the podcast. Long time at Morningstar, right? How many years you've been at Morningstar? I'll hit 18 years actually in in cool. June. So it's wow. it's been a a long journey, and it's been a a tremendous journey. Like Morningstar, you know, has been a great place to build a career, a, a great place, you know, to, to really, I, I think, connect with like a mission and in a mission I believe in, you know, very deeply, which is empowering investor success. And, you know, it kind of goes all the way back to, you know, I f- how we first got turned on to investing, which was through uh, my maternal grandfather. So my grandpa was a loyal subscriber to Louis Ruckheiser's uh, newsletter. Uh, I inherited his archive uh, when he passed, and you flip through it every now and then, and it's marked up with his own notes and, and pencils. Uh, he was an avid investor, passionate investor. You know, that's really when I kind of got the bug. Uh, you know, just to understand, uh, you know, the markets. Uh, you know, investing in, in general. Those memories of of you know talking about the world and markets and in stocks with my my grandpa Bob really kind of are, are the roots of uh, you know everything that's come subsequently in in my own career and I deeply value that experience and those connections because at the end of the day uh, that's what we're all here for is is really to be in service of the end investor to help them you know turn their wealth in, into more wealth and in turn fuel their their dreams their aspirations their hopes so. Um, yeah, it's something I, I think of each and every day. I wonder when you look, go back and look at those old notes, do you sometimes like, my, how things have changed, but how much they've stayed the same? Well, it's, it, it is really interesting, Ed, because I, I think when you think of everything that's stayed the same, everything that's steady state about the investment management profession, about uh, advice, you know, really what we're talking about at its core is just this massive information processing engine. You know, we take all of these various inputs, be it market prices, be it news, all over the globe, and we try to translate that information into insights. Those insights, in turn, we try to build portfolios with. 
And those portfolios ultimately are what help us accumulate wealth over time. That really remains entirely unchanged. I, I think what is very different today, if we fast forward a decade or two or three or four, so in 2024, Morningstar is celebrating its 40th birthday. Um, and you look at it through that lens, you know, Morningstar used to collect information on funds by cold calling fund companies and writing down the answer to scripted questions with a piece of pencil on an index card, turn around, put those answers into a database. And then our first product or one of our first products was a mutual fund binder, a literal three ring binder filled with fact sheets about mutual funds that you could find everywhere from your local public library to you know, via a, a subscription model. One of my first interactions with Morningstar was actually through the Principia CD-ROM when I worked on an advisor team at Morgan Stanley. So if, if you think about where we're at today, you know, on the eve of our 40th birthday, uh, you can now go into Morningstar Direct, which is our flagship software platform, and interact with an AI chatbot named Mo. That evolution, Ed, really has, has been dramatic in terms of you know, the types of information that we process. So now it's not just market prices. It can be things, uh, you know, with respect to like what IP addresses are getting hit in target stores to understand like whether or not paying up for end cap, like shelf space on the part of a, a product manufacturer makes sense uh, and how that ultimately translates to sales for a, a consumer goods manufacturer to ESG data to, you know, natural language processing being applied to transcripts of conference calls. So the amount and the types of data that we're processing on the front end are as great and as varied as, as they've ever been. And the way that we're translating that information to insights, leveraging technologies like AI, among other things, and ultimately delivering portfolios has continued to evolve. And I think some of the more, you know, interesting evolutions uh, are really with respect to you know how we package those insights into portfolios and how those portfolios increasingly are being built by either individuals or intermediaries and ultimately meeting their goals. Yeah, no, absolutely, and and this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm glad you're you're on the podcast to talk about what you're seeing there in the current state of the asset management business and how things are evolving. Um, most people might know you from. Um, how I know you from when you were covering ETS specifically as an analyst and what have you. Now, more recently, you've started as um, head of client solutions and talking to what other asset managers like Manac or others about what's about trends in the industry. And and before I turn off any individual investors, I think that's important to understand what asset managers are asking about and looking at and dealing with because they're probably reflecting what you're thinking about and uh, trying to help you out uh, better as well. I don't know. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, in my current capacity, a lot of what I do is spend a lot of time with Morningstar's asset management clients to try to understand what's top of mind for them. How are they evolving their businesses to continue to serve the end investor? How do we partner together? And what's ultimately a, a shared mission, right? Which is to take what in the minds of many is in incredibly complex, distill it down into something that's simple, that's actionable, that's going to help them drive forward and, and ultimately meet their long-term goals. So never a, a dull day, never a dull moment. And I think you know our, our clients, uh, as well as Morningstar, again, have that, that shared mission, which is ultimately to empower investor success. And you talked about the mass of, of data that's come across uh, and the wealth of data that we all have now at our fingertips. You put the asset management world in, 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 in the context of, say, software, and you provided a few different examples. Uh, I don't know, perhaps you can talk a little bit about that and you know what that really, what you're really getting at, what that really means for the for the future that you see coming. Yeah, and I, I think the evolution of this industry really is is inextricably linked to just the evolution of, of technology, right? The way that we literally process information. Um, so I mentioned the examples you know, from Morningstar's own history, from Binder to CD-ROM to AI chatbot. Uh, you, you see similar examples in our day-to-day. -day. So you know, Apple Macintosh just celebrated a, a birthday itself. Fast forward to you know Apple's trajectory as an example and 
Now we've got the iPhone 15 Pro, which you know is basically a, a full page worth of old like Radio Shack ads worth of electronic gadgets all distilled into one thing that's made of titanium and we're toting supercomputers around in our pockets these days. So I think really just emblematic of the way that you know, software and the marriage of software with elegant pieces of hardware has accelerated the way which we process information, respond to information. And what we see is that you know, there are many corollaries in, in the investment sphere. So when I think of different forms of software, I, I think of software and asset management in both sort of figurative and literal terms. So you know, figuratively speaking, I would argue that indexes, be they market indexes or be they indexes that try to sort of codify some sort of active insight or, or alpha signal are in many ways equivalent to software, right? It's a piece of code. It's a set of instructions that says, you know, I'm going to own these particular securities. I'm going to weight them in accordance to these rules. I'm going to maintain the board portfolio, rebalance it, reconstitute it once a quarter, once a year per these parameters. And what that does is it builds for scale, it builds for transparency, it builds for efficiency, and it drives down costs, no different than any other piece of software. So it's no surprise that when you look at where most of investors' money has been headed at the margin in recent years, it's increasingly inclined to prefer those sort of algorithmic, programmatic, index-driven portfolios over traditional discretionary active portfolios. And indeed, you know, just over the course of the past few years, when you look at just index funds as a cohort and then actively managed funds as a cohort, the swing in flows. So new money coming in from investors or being taken out of funds by investors, there's been about a trillion dollar swing uh, across that active to, to passive cohort, which is really pretty dramatic and a, a really big shift from what we saw, certainly if we were to go back in history, even just 10 years ago. Now, how much of that is due to the new technology of ETFs, you know, more vehicle as opposed to active versus passive? Yeah. So ETFs have, have certainly played a big part uh, in that. So you know, SPY, the first US listed ETF, just had its 31st birthday. Um, and what you see is that those two charts look awfully similar when you look at the long-term trajectory of index flows versus active flows, uh, when you look at the long-term trajectory, uh, net new money coming into ETFs versus mutual funds, there's a lot of similarities there. Uh, and what I would argue is that you, know, you need to think of these things, these distinctions is, is sort of investment content, investment strategy, where we talk about active and passive and all things in between. And the delivery of that content. So how do we wrap up those strategies, active, passive, in between, and get them into the hands of the portfolios of individual investors? And, and really what you've seen with ETFs is they've been a, a huge sort of technological advance, if you will, with respect to how we package and distribute investment strategies to individual investors. And you know, to date, while that's predominantly been in favor, the flows have been in favor of, of index strategies wrapped in this new wrapper that in many ways is more efficient than in traditional open-ended mutual fund, uh, more cost efficient, more tax efficient, and efficiency just with respect to compatibility. So people talk a lot about, oh, isn't this great? We can trade ETFs all day long. Yeah, that's interesting, but probably not best for most investors, I would argue. What's more interesting is just the compatibility with respect to how people want to consume investment strategies. So when I list an ETF on the New York Stock Exchange, anybody with a brokerage account can plug into that. So when I, I think of access and distribution and compatibility, I, I think ETFs from that perspective are a lot like what the Amazon Kindle has done you know, to your local bookseller. Much more compatible, much more, I think, aligned with the way in which Consumers are not just looking to consume investment strategies, but virtually everything these days. So you know, ETFs have, have really brought about this sea change, more so I would argue with respect to how investment strategies are delivered and consumed by investors. And you know, I think that is distinct from, in many ways, what we see with respect to investment strategy, investment content, 
in this active passive divide. And this is probably an, an old uh, argument, or not really argument, but old statement and and long debated. But is that the end of mutual funds? Are the, is the mutual fund industry dying? And who's winning in the mutual fund space? Yeah. So one of the chapters that I, I spend a lot of time speaking with uh, our clients about, I've, I've titled Life After Mutual Funds, uh, which sounds like a, a very lame daytime soap opera, but is is really the, the reality of where investors are, are allocating their dollars these days, which is to wrappers that are not a mutual fund. And, and ETFs have certainly played a starring role in Life After Mutual Funds. But if you go into other channels, um, it's not just ETFs that are winning. So if you look at the retirement channel, for example, so investors' 401k plans, what you see is in that channel, a, a lot of plan sponsors are opting out of mutual funds and in, into collective investment trusts or, or CITs. And they're doing that for a variety of reasons. So it's it's not just ETFs that, that have their straw in mutual funds milkshake. It's collective investment trusts, separately managed accounts. And that's because investors are realizing that they can get, in many cases, either the same or, or very similar investment strategies, same portfolio managers through these different wrappers that are, are more efficient with respect to costs, with respect to taxes, you name it. So I say life after mutual funds really for dramatic effect. Mutual funds are still very much alive and well. There are still trillions of dollars invested in mutual funds. There's still a tremendous amount of inertia that will keep them there for a long period of time. That said, if you look back to 2023, you know, within U.S. actively managed open-end mutual funds, just a third of them saw inflows last year. And the commonality among some of the biggest successes within that third, that minority that had inflows, is that they tend to be relatively sheltered uh, to the extent that they're largely distributed through 401k plans, retirement plans, uh, where ETFs have, for a variety of reasons, had difficulty making inroads, or in some cases, proprietary advice channels, where these mutual funds are just simply the building blocks for model portfolios in, in certain distribution channels. So mutual funds still have a place. They still have certain advantages. I, I think one of the key advantages being that mutual funds have the right to say no to new money. That's something that ETFs cannot do. Um, so for certain strategies, say a concentrated small cap value strategy uh, that can only put so much money to work and still deliver the goods for investors, that's a very important consideration from the point of view of those portfolio managers. So even when we see actively managed ETFs coming to market, what most firms are doing is, is spending a lot of time thinking about, is forfeiting that right to say no to the next dollar that comes in the door going to put us in a position where we would be doing our investors a disservice if we get $10 billion, $15 billion in this fund. So you know, mutual funds are, are still very much alive, but at the margin, every new dollar that is coming into the asset management industry is going into something that's not a traditional mutual fund. When you're talking to asset managers about the model business or models, I mean, that's been a bit big focus of our own. What stands out in terms of the direction of the conversations that you have with them? Does it go towards, uh, should we do proprietary models or should we do you know open architecture, third-party models, or why not just work with third-party strategists and get our funds included in other models? So when I think of, of models sort of more conceptually, Ed, it, it, it goes back to what I was alluding to before with indexes and in, in this almost sort of software-like construct, right? So the model really being a set of instructions for how to build a portfolio. While that sounds fairly rigid, what we see in practice is that it is really very dynamic. So the, the direction of travel in, in model portfolios, which advisors increasingly prefer, is that it develops consistency, a degree of uniformity with respect to how advisors are building portfolios. That certainly wasn't the case, you know, when I think back to you know the last days I was at Morgan Stanley in, in 2006. You know, this I, I think really is in, intended at its core to drive better, more consistent outcomes uh, for the end client, and you know, as a result, free up more of advisors' time to add value in 
other areas where they're more likely to add more value, um, which isn't necessarily in, in building portfolios, which you know, I, I think is very counter to many advisors' historical value proposition. So models as they're being expressed today increasingly are very dynamic. It's it's not just, you know, firm ABCs ETFs exclusively. So they're becoming more open architecture. You see partnerships between asset managers whereby uh, the models are marrying company ABC's ETFs with company XYZ's ETFs. Some may be active, some may be passive. Uh, we're seeing crossover across different types of strategies and in, in distribution mechanisms. So in some tax efficient models, for example, you know, the US equity portion of the portfolio may be delivered via direct indexing. And direct indexing in that instance is looking to harvest tax losses to further eke out tax efficiencies within that section of the portfolio. So models, I, I, I think, are, are really kind of evolving from degrees of personalization and customization, right? So we'll, what software is doing is driving all of this is you know, creating more and more sort of degrees of personalization and customization in a way that's actually efficient and scalable and cost effective for the end investor ways that weren't frankly like available to investors if you were to go back 10 20 30 years ago so it's it's the similar evolution i think of it you know my my sort of mental model here is is like based in the evolution of television sets right and pixelization so i i think back to you know the one and done allocation uh, funds as being the equivalent of the old black and white CRT television that my mom had in her sewing room growing up that had a you know clothes hanger for an antenna with some foil wrapped around it. And you fast forward to today and where we are is in like super high definition OLED like I I can't even keep up with it frankly at any more like where we're at. But the degree of pixelization, personalization and the efficiencies and the cost, it's all moved in a, a direction that I think is very favorable for the end investor. It is also driving efficiencies for advisors because, again, they get to spend more time adding more value in other areas outside of portfolio management on behalf of their clients. Yeah, absolutely. And you're seeing trends towards more holistic financial planning. And I guess if you can free up that, you know, building the portfolio element, they can concentrate on other things, life planning for their estate planning for their clients, things of that sort. Yeah, definitely. At the, at the margin, you know, you hear chatter out in the market about, you know, do advisors in the future look more like life coaches and you go go back 20 years in time and, you know, ask your average advisor if they'd ever like tell their client to eat more vegetables and they'd probably <laughs> say, you know, that, that, that's none of my business. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's been interesting to watch um, you know, just that that evolution. Yeah, that's great, and and I, I uh, thank you for that explanation on on the model front too. Because I I think back in my days at at Ibbotson Associates, it's like oh, we had models, and models have been around forever. They're asset allocation models, and you know what what's the deal with today? And I you know I think uh, the way you put it in terms of the way you talk about the trends in the industry as software and evolution, you know, kind of new technologies. I, I think that really makes a whole lot of sense. And yeah, I remember those days too, where, you know, home offices were concerned about consistency and the liabilities that come with that. So if you can have somebody put a client in a, in a more customized model now, but nonetheless, a rules-based uh, kind of framework, uh, all the better for the investor and, and the advisor and the firm as well. Yeah. I mean, it, Ed, we're, we're doing all the same things, right, that you were doing back in your Ibbotson days, we're just doing them you know, better, faster, cheaper in, in, you know, by extension for, for more, right. For, for more, uh, investors and in, in hopefully in the future, more investors that historically would, if they weren't underserved, they, they, you know, haven't been served historically at all. So that for me is, is exciting. More recently, yields are back. Bonds are back. Do you have a, a positive outlook on, on more fixed income offerings to come? Yeah, it, it, it long lasted. The, the risk-free return has, has returned, right? I, if I had a nickel for every time I heard somebody make the joke about return-free risk in reference to U.S. treasuries over the course of recent years, I'd probably be retired right now and I'd probably still love to catch up with you from whatever private island I was living on. But Nonetheless, it's a, a very different environment we're living in today, and it's not been surprising that 
you know, in response to a number of factors, one of it, those factors being higher yields, another factor being, you know, the banking scare that, that we lived through in early 2023, that large chunk of money has gone into money market funds. The median yield there is around 5%. Uh, you've seen lots and lots of money flock into to that category. Not uh, for dissimilar reasons, uh, we saw bonds come back within bond fund categories. And even um, when we were discussing before, you know, where are those pockets of strength among actively managed open-ended mutual funds? Uh, the majority of the top 10 active mutual funds by flows in 2023 were core bond strategies. So I, I think for a variety of reasons, both cyclical, because there's actually yield to be had, as well as secular, right? So you know, more and more of the money increasingly is in the hands of people who are in or nearing retirement. And there's just that natural sort of evolution, that natural preference, be it codified in a target date fund glide path or, or just sort of standard portfolio optimization that starts to drive at the margin a, a preference for, for bonds for fixed income. I think that's going to continue to be the case. You know, question we get oftentimes is, hey, all that money market fund money, like when does that come back into play and come back into to risk assets? Honestly, I, I don't know. Right now, people seem to be of the opinion that they're getting paid sufficiently to wait. Now, you know, is that short-sighted? There's always, you know, opportunity cost, right? When, you know, you're sitting on a relatively safe asset earning a 5% or so yield. Meanwhile, watching, you know, markets rally in a way that I don't think anybody thought, uh, you know, they were going to rally over the course of the past 12 months or so. It's always about trade-offs at, at the end of the day. And there's always going to be opportunity costs. This market still defies logic to me sometimes. <laughs> Just on the on the on the bond side front, do you see any white space in terms of new types of offerings or bond strategies, bond ETFs? I don't know if there's much white space within you know, the fixed income strategies category. It's a category that, by design, by intent, should very well be boring, right? <laughs> a, a very risk controlled, middle of the road core fixed income allocation. Like people don't buy bonds because they want surprises either to the upside or, or the downside, generally speaking. Now that said, there are all sorts of sort of interesting categories within fixed income markets where we have continued to see really interesting and innovative ideas, right? When you think of subsectors of the bond markets like fallen angels, like floating rate loans, you know, categories that in the early days of, of ETFs in particular, you would think, you know, never in a million years would you be able to efficiently package that um, you know, into this new wrapper. We've gone beyond that. I, I myself can remember back to the the time of the first, uh, you know, senior bank loan ETFs, and, and thinking there's just no way, no how. Um, you know, and today it's a category that's got billions upon billions of dollars, and you know, does a tremendous amount of trading volume on any given day. So, uh, you know, I think we're going to continue to see innovation at the margin, but those innovations increasingly are niche. And what's interesting to me is that. Those innovations are basically doing for bond markets what everybody's wanted to try to do for bond markets for you know as, as long as anyone can remember, which is bring greater liquidity, greater transparency, just generally more efficiency. And, and lo and behold, when you- This brings us back to technology. <laughs> yeah. You, you, you wrap these bonds into an equity instrument and trade them on you know the New York Stock Exchange or SIBO or NASDAQ, you, you kind of brought- bond markets forward to to the future. Um, so I think that's really like in my mind very interesting. And that's a case too when we go back to like, you know, active versus passive and is active dead. You know, what we see at the margin is that a lot of active managers now are using nominally passive building blocks, like a fallen angels bond ETF or bank loan bond ETF to express active views within actively managed portfolios because they're just more efficient. Not to say that there isn't room for innovation there. It's just it's it's um, you know happening in a way that I I think makes some of those core bond portfolios potentially more efficient, more dynamic, and maybe at the margin expands their opportunity set. But most of the interest, again, to go back to where I started, most of the new money is going back to basics, right? Like bonds are are for most investors supposed to be boring, um, but what's exciting underneath the hood is 
just the way in which you know those those bond portfolio managers can think about constructing their portfolios and expressing their views. Yeah, I guess with this new technology, and I'm still stuck in the ETF world, right? But you know, this new technology of ETFs has has allowed people to implement portfolios. I think a smarter way it doesn't have to be just with old school academic benchmark tracking funds. It can be funds that have these rules or active management that with rigid rules to to do what's best for the asset class. Absolutely. Um, let's see, I've got a few minutes left with you, so maybe I can get your quick take on a few other things. I really wanted to ask you about the future of ESG. The future of ESG. So I, I, I think the future of ESG, the biggest question in, in my mind, you know, what, what are we going to call ESG next? You look at the long history of, of ESG, you, this is a category that's been with us now for decades, and, and you know, evolution is a key theme here, right? Of, of our conversation. So I think the way in which views around all considerations ESG have been expressed, have only expanded, evolved, the data set has expanded exponentially over the years uh, with respect to how investors can assess and incorporate real risks, right? Like part of the issue with ESG right now, I, I think is a branding issue in a better brand in many cases is just frankly risk. These are risks that oftentimes don't come up. They should be treated in many respects, in my opinion, no differently than any other form of risk that any investor might consider. So I think part of what we have here is, is a branding issue, which I like start with, like, what do we call it next? Well, there's always been an interest in something socially responsible or absolutely. environmental or something. Yeah, absolutely. And part of that, right, is because for many investors, it, it, it's written into their investment policy statement. There are certain things that they simply cannot invest in, or there are certain areas where they are absolutely trying to drive an impact. So they need to partner with you know, an investor that can implement those views on their behalf. So I, I don't think that changes. I think what you'll inevitably see, no different than we saw you know, years ago with you know, Smart Beta, which was just the newest name. So there are these, these fashion cycles, these things that come and go that have new names, but are, are always there. They just might not be front and center. I think we're just going to continue to see an ongoing evolution. Um, I think there's a significant sort of political and regulatory overhang is weighing down this category in the US. 2023 was the first time we saw outflows in, in ages uh, across ESG products in the US, but they've still got hundreds of billions of dollars in assets because there are still thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of investors that say, this is a manner of investing that aligns with my unique preferences, circumstances, worldview. So not going away. We'll see an ebb and flow. Really curious to know, you know, what, 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 what we call it next. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we got to break up the E, S, and G. And if you want environmental, go to environmental. You want social, that do that. Or governance. Governance should be a part of every strategy. Absolutely. At least any active strategy. But, uh, absolutely. So let me let me ask you this then. Uh, what, what's one long term trend you see playing out over the next year or several years? So Ed, it, it, it's a great question. As we look forward, you know, one of the biggest questions in in my mind, I, I, I think, is one of the best, biggest questions in a lot of investors' mind, which is what now? Now, what we see is that many investors face this this question, which is, okay, now that I've got my money pile, now that I'm not necessarily adding any more money. How do I spend it sensibly, responsibly? Spend it at all. One of the biggest challenges we we hear from a lot of our clients, from a lot of advisors, is that they have a lot of you know, investor clients that are just terrified to spend money. They've reached retirement and they're holed up in their home and like won't go out to dinner on a Friday night with you know their partner or whatever. You know, in my mind, that is going to be and very much is a multifaceted problem. That will require multifaceted solutions. So part of that solution inevitably, I think, is going to be an evolution of the asset management product set. Most asset management product today is designed to build wealth over time, uh, where there's going to need to be, I think, a combination of, of product, of software, of advice, of, of coaching on how to navigate this transition from I, I need to build the pile of money to now I need to draw from that pile of money. And, and what you see in many cases, I think there are interesting examples and in, in sort of the inverse of what's driven success through investors' accumulation phase, right? So 
some of the biggest successes have been some of the simplest fixes, like making people opt out of contributing to their retirement plan. So automatic deferral, automatic increase of, of deferral amounts, QDIA, right? So the qualified uh, default investment in 401k plans going from, say, a, a stable value money market type fund now to, in many cases, a target date fund. So I think if you think about what are the inverse of some of those very simple solutions, um, so kind of a, a, a paycheck program. So if you're not going to take money out on your own, we're going to send you a paycheck every two weeks, much as you got when you were working, uh, that ensures that you're actually spending um, and you're doing so systematically. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see, in my mind, you know, just how everyone in the industry works together to make sure that investors are every bit as successful in spending their money as they were in, in, in building that wealth, because that was the whole point to begin with. Right, right. Yeah, that's the one thing I'm afraid of now in this world of 401ks versus, say, pensions is, I don't think I'll have trouble spending money, but I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, I just want to be careful that I'm not like, you know, 88 years old and, and I've got nothing in the bank and, you know, I got all kinds of health problems or whatever it is. Well, all right, let me hit you up on on uh, in our speed round, trend or fad, get your quick take on maybe three to five concepts, but love to know what you think about blockchain, trend or fad. Well, I think it's a trend. So I think important to, to separate you know, blockchain probably from things that are, are built on blockchain, but you know, blockchain, no different than software, no th different than technology at large in my mind, is is just an evolution of like how we you know, manage, validate data. I that's just an inevitability that we're going to, you know, get better at whipping zeros and ones around the world and validating, you know, the the veracity of that information. How about artificial intelligence trend or fad? Absolutely a trend. Uh, yeah, artificial intelligence in my mind is really just an evolution uh, in the way that you know we process information, um, that we build software, you name it. So. Um, you know, it's, it's a trend I think that's going to shape a lot of things that, you know, we see in our day to day. It, it already is. It already frankly has been for, for quite some time. Um, so I, I think it's, it's really exciting in my mind in particular, just to think about how that's going to shape the way that we interact with software that we build, that, that others build and, and make, you know, things across the board better, faster, cheaper. Uh, all right. So the next one. So you're in you're in Chicago, right? And dealing with the Chicago winter. Have you noticed any Teslas broken down on the side of the road? And the question would be EVs, trend or fad? E EVs. I I I I think all all things sort of alternative fuel. Um, I I think will be a, a long term trend. In in many cases, people in Chicago drive their Teslas to and from the grocery store. So. The likelihood that they'll break down is much, much lower. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's there's certainly plenty of plenty of those around, um, and it's I think another case where we're probably still very early, just in the the technology cycle, and there's just so much to be done. I mean, it took us over a hundred years to get where we are now today with uh, you know our massive global fleet of internal combustion engines. Um, so it's 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 not something that's going to happen over overnight. It, the shift to, to something else. All right. And then finally, return to office mandates, trend or fad? Um, I, kind of both, to be honest, Ed. I, I know our own policy now is that we're back you know, three days a, a, a week. I think the reality of the matter is that you know, these days with all the technology we have at our disposal, with the fact that we're you know, operating a global enterprise, people can work well for just about anywhere. I mean, I'm, I'm in the comfort of my own office and my own basement and my own home. Um, I can be, you know, every bit as efficient here as I can, you know, in our offices, downtown Chicago, as I can, you know, sitting on the the sidelines of, you know, my daughter's soccer practice in, in the evening hours. So I think that the future of work is working from just about anywhere. Absolutely. Well, awesome. I love that answer. And hopefully uh, our CEO listens to the end of this podcast. And <laughs> <laughs> Um, but, uh, all good. Uh, Ben, thank you so much for your time and, and insights today. Thank you for joining the podcast. It's been a lot of fun, Ed. I really appreciate the opportunity. And by the way, what's the best way for people to, uh, learn more about what you're doing, follow you, stay in touch with, uh, with everything Ben Johnson and Morningstar? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think, you know, the, the world's window to Morningstar is, is really on our, our website, morningstar.com, which showcases all of 
the wonderful data and research that, that my colleagues around the world are producing on a day in day out basis. If you want to find me personally, uh, you can find me out on social media. So I'm on uh, LinkedIn and I'm on uh, Twitter as well with a combination of industry data and bad dad jokes at uh, M star Ben Johnson. Perfect. Well, thanks again. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of Trends with Benefits.